for our panel this evening, we have Barbara Jones Brown, and she is currently the director of Signature Books. She came to Signature from the Mormon History Associ Association, where she served as executive director for nearly four years. Previously, she worked as historical director of Better Days 2020 and as content editor of the award-winning Massacre at Mountain Meadows for the History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She is the co-author with Richard Turley of Vengeance is Mine, the Mountain Meadows Massacre and its Aftermath, forthcoming this April. Brown earned a master's degree in American history from the University of Utah and a bachelor's degree in journalism with an English minor from Brigham Young University. Next, we have Sandra McGee Tanner. She is a writer and researcher who has published archival and evidential materials about the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sandra, along with her husband, Gerald, founded the Utah Lighthouse Ministry, which they ran for over 60 years. Mm -hmm. Some of their publications include Mormonism, Shadow or Reality, The Case Against Mormonism, The Mormon Kingdom, and Evolution of the Mormon Temple Ceremony, 1842 to 1990. She and Gerald and their ministry are the subject of the book, Lighthouse, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, Despise the Beloved Critics of Mormonism by Ron Huggins. Ron Huggins received his PhD from the University of Toronto, the Toronto School of Theology. He taught at Moody Bible Institute Northwest, Salt Lake Theolo Theological Seminary, and Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he also served as managing editor of the Midwestern Journal of Theology. He is the author, as Barbara stated, of recently released Lighthouse, Gerald and Sandra Tanner Despise the Beloved Critics of Mormonism. His writings in the fields of worldview, psychology, and comparative religion have appeared in the Evangelical Dictionary of World Religions and Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. He and his wife, Marguerite, have four children and 10 grandchildren. Gary James Bergera is recently retired as Managing Director of the Smith Pettit Foundation in Salt Lake City former director of Signature Books, and former managing editor of Dialogue, a, jur a journal of Mormon thought. He is co-author of Brigham Young University, A House of Faith, editor of Line Upon Line, Essays on Mormon Doctrine, the autobiography of B.H. Roberts, Statements of the LDS First Presidency, and Confessions of a Mormon Historian, The Diaries of Leonard J. Arrington, and Conflict in the Quorum. He is co-editor of companion volumes of Joseph Smith's Quorum, of the Anointed and the Nauvoo Endowment Companies and that Desert Trails with Everett Roos. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, our story tonight starts really with Sandra Tanner and her and her husband Gerald, her late husband Gerald's book, Mormonism, Shadow or Reality. And this is so cool because Sandra brought all of these versions and she's gonna tell you about them tonight. Okay. <clears throat> this is show and tell. <clears throat> Back in <clears throat> 1963, and most of you weren't alive then. <laughs> uh, I was only three, but. Uh, <laughs> is our mimeograph 1963 edition of Mormonism. And if you don't know what mimeograph is, this is what it looks like. <laughs> and if you feel the cover, the paper is a thicker kind of paper because it has to absorb the ink from the kind of process they use for that. And anyone that's ever used one will recognize the print and the look of it right off when you look in it. Uh, this is before photocopy machines, before computers, before electric typewriters, <laughs> when they had card indexes at the library, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you had to actually read books. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so it represents a lot of time reading. Anyways, this is our 1963 mimeograph. You notice the odd binding on it. We had to find a way to, first off, we had to find a way to print it because nobody, of course, wants to print uh, critical material in 63 on Mormonism in Salt Lake City. <laughs> and uh, so we had to get a mimeograph, do it ourselves. And then the problem was, how do you bind it? How do you keep it together? So uh, we finally found out about these uh, metal things that you put 
uh, you had to, we had to drill the holes by hand. We have the little thing, you put that in and you have to drill the hole down, turn a, a knob to get it down, to get the thing through, and then they clasp in the back so you could actually take it all apart. Anyways, that's 63. Gerald was never idle. And so 64, <laughs> he brings out his new one because we had moved up to the point of getting a small little offset press. And uh, so, but then this gets into the next problem is Gerald wasn't sure he could do a backside printing on the press. So he invented the idea of laying the two pages out on one page and then leaving the backside blank. <laughs> Unique, but uh, it, it got the job done. So this is, this is an expanded version. It's got more material in it. So we kept studying and writing and <laughs> our families and friends kept saying, well, you just have four quotes on that. So not to be put down, he determined he was gonna get 10 quotes on everything. And so in 72, we had to bring out the enlarged edition of uh, Mormonism Shadow Reality. And those of you that saw Under the Manor of Heaven, when Detective Pyle is sitting in the car reading the book where he has his faith uh, uh, breakdown, this is the book that he's holding in the car. And if you looked at the uh, picture in the TV show, you can tell that it's this book because you can see the breakdown of the chapter of the line of the page and everything to know this is what uh pyre was his name wasn't it uh this is what he's looking at so anyways this is the edition that quinn wrote his don't give it quite away yet the anonymous historian <laughs> Who shall remain unnamed for a few minutes? <laughs> responded to this book. This is the edition that he would have written his response to. Okay, so. Now that was Manny Quinn, right? Manny Quinn. Okay, so Manny there you go, yeah. Manny Quinn. Um, so, Sandra, tell us about a, a character that comes into play in, in this story is Reed Durham, and tell us about Reed, your friend Reed, and this book and his affiliation with you and Gerald. <clears throat> well, in the late 60s, uh, with the Book of Abraham stuff coming into uh, popularity because the papyri were um, presented to the Mormon Church for the Metropolitan Museum, everybody in Utah was trying to figure out Egyptian. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gerald and my daughter had little cards that they had done up for Egyptian words. <laughs> <laughs> for the Book of the Dead, and they do flashcards on learning Egyptian. Anyway, my house was real weird. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, we're studying all things Egyptian. Nibley comes out with his articles in the, what had been the Improvement Era then? Hugh Nibley. Hugh Nibley at BYU was writing about this, and we were writing rebuttals, and so uh, that's another thing that kept getting our books enlarged because there were so many uh, news items at that time. You had the First Vision stuff uh, with Paul Chessman, um, the 1832 First Vision account. That created all kind of newsworthy stuff. The Book of Abraham, uh, and uh, then coming up with all the racial stuff, and then in the 70s you get the uh, Blacks and Priesthood. But anyway, so there was a lot of stuff going on in that time period on Mormon research. Well, Reed Durham was the head of the Institute of Religion at the University of Utah. Reed was a faithful Mormon, but he used to come down and talk with Gerald. And they shared research, but it wasn't just Reed. I mean, um, who was the polygamous guy? Ogden Kraut used to come down and talk with Gerald and then share research on polygamy. So uh, Gerald, had a working friendship with a number of people from different points of view. So even though we were 
uh, ex-Mormons, uh, by choice, uh, ex asked for our names to be taken off, so we got excommunicated. But anyways, in spite of that, we had friends with different people doing historical research. Reed came down and would talk to us about our different research projects. He always maintained his faith in Mormonism. It was not that he was coming down to commiserate with us or anything. <laughs> he was clearly the defender side, but uh, we were interested in all the same research areas. Well, Reed had a special class at the Institute that you could only take by interview with the teacher. And this was an advanced class in Mormon history. And uh, it was my understanding that it, to get in the class, you had to uh, be interviewed where he would ask you certain uh, topics and see if you what you knew about him. Like, uh, what does it say to you when I say Council of 50, um, Blood Atonement, uh, Mount Metal Massacre? I mean, there were just certain things. If you didn't already know about him, you weren't getting in the class. Uh, because you had to be ready to discuss the problem areas. He used our book as the textbook. And he actually would order these a dozen books at a time for his class. And I don't think that's what got him in trouble uh, <laughs> because it really came in 72 when he gave a talk to the, was it Mormon History Association? Uh, his talk on is there no help for a widow's son on the uh, Masons and Mormon temple ritual similarities. That's, I understand, what really got him in trouble. But he was using our book as a textbook. Okay, so that, thanks for setting that up for us, Sandra. So um, in 1976, there's a young, uh, recently finished his PhD at Yale, historian that's working for the church history department named D. Michael Quinn. And he gets called into his mentor's office, Leonard J. Arrington, at what was then called the, the HDC or the Historical Division of the Church. So from Quinn's memoir, June 14th, 1976. Today at the Historical Division of the Church, Leonard Arrington told me that Mormonism, shadow or reality, was being used by ministers throughout the nation to lead investigators away from the church. It was published by Utah ex-Mormons Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who had become evangelical Protestant crusaders against Mormonism in 1960. Did you get that part right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, this is reading from Quinn's memoir. Um, and in his memoir, he quotes his diary. So a lot of times, these are diary uh, entries from that day. He said, Leonard asked me to write a detailed assessment of its expanded edition. I told him that I would do it for him. In two days, Dave Mayfield, an employee in the church library section of HDC, renewed the request since Leonard had also talked with him. Mayfield asked me to check with him before starting the project so that he could brief me about the kinds of inquiries about the Tanner's work he has received from many mission presidents, missionaries, stake presidents, bishops, and rank and file Mormons. Leonard and Dave would like to have a lengthy reply to send out. Leonard suggested that I follow a letter format. It is ironic that in my own view and in the view of others, I am a capable defender of the faith from my historical viewpoint. Whereas in the minds of others, I am a destroyer of the faith by that same viewpoint. In preparing my response to Shadow or Reality, I received helpful suggestions from four people at HDC. First, Dave Mayfield outlined the topics that most troubled those Mormons who had written to HDC. Then, as usual, Leonard and then his two advisors, Davis Bitten and Jim Allen, made comments on my first draft. Only two persons gave me enough input to be considered collaborators on my response, even though they weren't trained as historians. One was graduate student Doyle Buchanan, who had an interest in biblical scholarship, whom I asked for input. The other was physician Lester Bush. That surprised me. Um, 
Although Lester Bush was an amateur historian, his dialogue article on the priesthood restriction against blacks had impressed me with his careful scholarship, insights, and erudition. Otherwise, I worked alone in responding to the Tanners. This was a saga that did not reach its conclusion for 18 months, and then it roiled Utah Mormon culture. <laughs> so Quinn goes on. Sometime after July 1976, I was called into Leonard's office. There I found Reed Durham, a senior instructor at the University of Utah's LDS Institute of Religion. Leonard told him at this private meeting that I was writing a rebuttal of shadow or reality and asked if Reed had any suggestions. He didn't and seemed oddly noncommittal. <laughs> I wonder if that's because he was friends with Gerald yeah. and Sandra. Not a bad. <laughs> yes. um, I sat there wishing that Leonard had left him uninformed. Perhaps sensing that Reed had misgivings, Leonard asked him to keep this project confidential. The historical department might want to use some version of what I wrote as an unsigned reference work for those who made inquiries about this anti-Mormon publication. Neither Leonard nor I knew that Reed Durham had been providing Gerald and Sandra Tanner with their sensational research and quotes since the 1960s. And so Sandra, I wanted to ask you, was that, was that guess by Quinn accurate? Was, was Reed Durham providing you with quotes? No, he was not. Uh, I want to clear Reed's name, <laughs> but he, he was not uh, collaborating with Gerald to help improve Gerald's arguments against the church. He was sharing research on different areas that uh, Gerald was also looking at, but not in any sense of in sympathy of what we were doing. They just both were interested in the same material. Okay. Yeah. So we've, we've clarified that. <laughs> I, don't, so, I don't want read name to be defamed. I'll, I'll, put in, I'll put in a footnote annotating that, Sandra, yeah, based right. on your testimony. Okay, so that happened, that meeting with, with Leonard and Mike and Reed Durham in Leonard's office was sometime after July 1976. And then let's hear what Leonard is saying about this whole thing. So Gary is going to read excerpts from Leonard's diary, August 19th, 1976. So this is just, this will be a very brief excerpt because Arrington tended to be very, very reticent about this particular project. Arrington tended to be very, very reticent about uh, mentioning this particular project in his diaries. He, he doesn't really do it. The very first mention, I think, that comes up is, in, uh, is on August 19, 1976. But Barbara, before I do this, I wanted to ask you, is it, is it your impression that uh, uh, Mike starts to work on this project in is it a year before, or is it just shortly yeah, before he, this? He says it's June 1976 that he starts. Is it your impression then that by the date of Arrington's diary, which is August 19, he's done, he's finished it? Because, uh, because Arrington says that Quinn has written, he, he doesn't cite Quinn by name, he just says that there's an unyet, unpu, unyet published rebuttal to the Tanner's work that, that is an excellent rebuttal to the book entitled Mormonism Shadow Reality that had been presented to us, meaning the historical, depart the, the historical department, uh, by an unnamed individual. So, so Quinn is not named yet in, well, Quinn is never named, I don't think, um, but, he, uh, uh, but he's unnamed. So, so I, this would have been like, knowing knowing what we know about publishing Quinn, he was probably still working on it. <laughs> well, he, I'm just wondering if he had a first draft done. Yeah. And so then he was just still. There's, yeah. Because that would have been fast. That would have been like two months that he was that he worked on and finished. So, Brian Buchanan, who's annotating his diaries. Yeah. Do you have any insights, Brian? Yes. So about two weeks after Leonard talks to him about it initially, he goes to meet with Doyle Buchanan. It's unclear from the journal entry whether he has a draft by that point. It seems like he does. And he asked Doyle to help him with the biblical stuff. So it seems like within a couple weeks, he had at least some semblance of a draft done. Yeah, so he starts right away, yeah. and we just don't know how far he well, is. Well, that would make sense time. to me yeah. with, with yeah. Quinn, that he would have done something quickly. He was just finishing the, another article, the, the, the Spanish-American War, and then he started on it. 
Okay, so I'm just for our um, audience that we're recording this for, the comment from Brian Buchanan, who is annotating Quinn's diaries, uh, he said that within two weeks after Quinn uh, met with Leonard Arrington about writing this pamphlet, he is working on it and is meeting with a uh, graduate student, student uh, Doyle Buchanan, about the biblical sections. So it does sound, from, from Arrington's diary, it does sound like, like within about two months, Quinn has finished a draft. Of, of, of the response. So now Ron is going to talk about from Lighthouse what's going on with Gerald Tanner. Okay, what happened? Oh yes, right. What happens is that um, Gerald has this conversation uh, and he just wrote down a few words in De on December 12th, 1976. And somebody's talking to him, it's probably Reed Durham, and telling him about this, this response that the church is planning. And Gerald writes it down and, and actually mentions Quinn's name and it mentions David Mayfield's name. And they're just both in little boxes and it says it's for the first presidency. And you can't really make anything out of the the note, unless you're Gerald, which is common with his notes. And uh, then he puts it in a box somewhere and uh, and forgets about it. And this is how, uh, just as an aside, Gerald, when Gerald finished a project, when Santa finishes a project, it, it's neatly filed. When Gerald finishes a project, it gets thrown in a box with a bunch of other stuff, magazine clippings, books, uh, letters, and then it gets closed and stuck in the attic. And so this was the first um, encounter. Oh, still not just, getting just, just closer. Not so let me just uh, read what happens then is that in April 11th, 1977, so we're still about a half a year off from this appearance of this pamphlet. Uh, Reed Durham tells a university student, University of Utah student named, um, Oh, Stephen Russell. What? Stephen is Russell. No, it's uh, Richard Marshall. Oh, Richard's Marshall. Stephen Marshall. Thank you. Uh, old age, and he goes. He's producing a, a like a, a bachelor's honors thesis, and he goes around and he's speaking with historians, who and he's apparently recording them, and uh, then he puts this all into this thesis, which ends up as Arrington later said to be a bomb that went off later. And here's one of the things he heard from Reed Durham is that, quote, due the, that due to the large number of letters, the church historian's office is receiving asking for answers to the things the Tanners have published. A certain scholar uh, who remained unnamed um, was appointed to write a general answer to the Tanners, including advice on how to read uh, anti-Mormon literature. This unnamed person solicited the help of Reed Durham on the project. <laughs> the work is finished, but its publication is delayed, according to what Leonard Arrington told Durham, because they cannot decide how or where to publish it, because the article is an open and honest approach to the <coughs> problems, although it is uh, it by no means answers all the questions raised by the Tanners. Um, it will be published anonymously to avoid any difficulties which could result uh, were such an article connected with an official church agency. Okay, so Quinn finished this, this manuscript and the powers that be take a look at it and they say, mm, we don't want to publish this. So this is in the, that was in April of 1977 by late summer of 1977, Quinn writes this. Leonard told me that the historical department wasn't going to use what I had written. As my journal stated, without his knowing that I was its author, Brother G. Homer Durham, who is the um, church historian, managing director of, of the church history division at the time, Brother G. Homer Durham, Durham called it brilliant, but said that he did not think it would be necessary to publish it as it might create more questions than it answered. 
Without giving details, Leonard told me that there were objections to its approaches, style, examples, and arguments. And I gotta tell you, I've, I've read it and it is so <laughs> over my head. I'm a trained historian and I'm reading this pamphlet and it's, it's classic Michael Quinn, just if A and B and C, then it cannot equal X, Y, and Z. I mean, it's just all over the place. Um, so I, I can see where uh, the church history department leaders are coming from. Like, I, I don't know how many people are even gonna understand it, uh, along with the fact that it raises a lot of questions. Um, so Mike says back to Leonard, don't they even want to paraphrase sections of it in answering letters from people the Tanners have disillusioned, I asked. Leonard said that he didn't agree, but the answer was no. I was both uncomprehending and angry. Then I'll borrow the money to publish it myself under my own name, Mike Quinn. <laughs> um, but Leonard wanted it to be anonymous. So that came from Leonard. I thought I could borrow enough to pay for 300 to 500 cheap eight by 10 photocopies of typed text, but Leonard promised to give me $600. He said that I had to leave him out of any further knowledge of what I did with it. Through Jim Allen, the College of Social Sciences prepared a camera-ready version of the anonymous response. I laughed when he reported to me that BYU Dean Hickman said, I've read that paper you gave me to type and I know who the author is. It's Richard Bushman. <laughs> That, con that reconfirmed the wisdom of Leonard's wish. I don't know if it was very wise, but that reconfirmed the wisdom of Leonard's wish that the author remain unnamed. More people might read it to figure out who wrote it, and I was eager for it to have wide readership. So Quinn goes on, um, and he's still kind of waffling a little bit, but he writes on October 1st, 1977 in his memoir, um, he finalized his decision to publish his response to the Tanners anonymously, explaining, in addition to a renewed prospect of my divorce, at that time, uh, he and his wife, Jan, started talking about the possibility of divorce. Um, I lived with the anxiety of being exposed as gay. He was a closeted uh, gay man at the time still. Despite my efforts to avoid homosexual temptations, I didn't want my reply to anti-Mormonism to be dismissed simply because of my failures in life, I assume he's referring to his marriage uh, failing, or due to any public humiliations that might one day occur. So I left it anonymous. That was what Leonard wanted for prudential reasons, and, it, and I didn't explain my personal ones to anyone. So Sandra, you just heard this for the first time um, these things coming from Mike, and I just wonder what, what you thought when you heard these things for the first time recently. Well, um, I was surprised that he commented on all of this so frankly, uh, and it's fascinating to see the interchange between him and Arrington and the different <coughs> scholars of when they're trying to figure out how to do this. They don't want to get in trouble with the church, and, and yet they want to give a response to us, but uh, it's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And they're on the horns of a dilemma of, they'd like to really give it to us, <laughs> but um, their hands are tied because they get the brethren mad if they talk too much about the problem areas. How do you talk enough about it to help people stay in the church and yet not have others mad at you because you told too much that they weren't ready to hear. You have to remember, this is in seven, 1977, and people didn't know all the stuff that we know today and uh, all the research has been done since then. So, I mean, these were really sensitive days to bring up any kind of uh, uh, dirty laundry <laughs> of a general authority or anything, or to talk too openly about problems of Joseph Smith's, uh, they weren't talking about different accounts of the first vision, or they weren't telling you that, oh, isn't it wonderful he used a seer stone in his hat? I mean, it, it, 
nobody admitted to these things at the time. <laughs> okay, so by mid-October 1977, Quinn writes this, Leonard's generosity caused me to aim very high. I contacted print shops, and we have a professional printer here with us today. <laughs> um, I contacted print shops to see how many copies of a booklet I could get by adding some of my own money, five to $700, as I recall, to what Leonard was giving. We call that was uh, $600. I decided to use my several hundred dollars of unspent National Endowment for the Humanities Research Funds <laughs> that he and for a trip that Jan and I had been planning to the Orient this spring. Um, that money Quinn journaled on December 12th when he paid the printer is basically all gone as of today. It has been put to better use. I'm not sure if Jan agreed. <laughs> um, he says, I doubt that Jan was happy about trading her trip to Asia for printing a pamphlet, but she never complained about my decision. It's 30 something printer and Rick Dillman, who's a printer in our audience, says who's missing several fingers. I don't know if you have any guesses who this printer might have been in 1977 in his 30s. I was in Germany at the time. Well, we know it's not you because you have all your fingers, right? Uh, but anyways, I'd love to find out who the printer was. That would be another piece of the mystery. Um, this printer seemed personally supportive of the project and accepted the amount of money I offered. I didn't ask, but he may have even done this print job for no profit. In any event, I was thrilled that my budget of about 1200 resulted in 2,000 nice looking booklets of 63 pages each. And we have some right here tonight for anyone who wants one. Um, I paid about $100 for stamps to mail 350 copies by third class delivery to every LDS Institute and mission home in the United States and Canada, plus to the presiding officers of stakes and wards in the West and to various Mormon historians. My journal described this as, quote, my Christmas present to the church. <laughs> I would just add, I would like to know what those guys thought of the pamphlets when they got them and if they even knew what he was talking about. <laughs> so he said, this was my Christmas present to the church, but I didn't tell Leonard that I intended to transfer 1,600 copies of my response to bookseller Sam Weller. Quinn also sent a copy, this is an aside, but Quinn also sent a copy of the tract uh, to the RLDS archives in an envelope that was po postmarked December 13th with the return address of 254 South Main, which was Sam Weller's bookstore. <laughs> so Quinn writes, distributing them was a problem since I wanted to remain anonymous. I decided to pay one month's rent on a storage locker where the booklets would remain until I picked up my employees of Weller's bookstore to which I anonymously sent the key and instructions. The journal described the above as my, quote, comic opera arrangements, close quote. A shrewd businessman with this windfall of free booklets, Sam sold them for 50 cents each. You can get them tonight for $10. <laughs> um, I knew that word of mouth would spread among Weller's regular clients who were accustomed to finding unusual or rare Mormon books at his Zion's bookstore. <clears throat> so Ron wrote about what happens next on the Tanner side of things in Lighthouse. Yes, and I, I should say that I didn't know if I believed this story until I heard it from the, the horse's mouth, because it was just so odd. And if you'll bear with me to read the paragraph from Lighthouse. Wilfred Clark, an employee of Salt Lake City's venerable Sam Weller's Zions Bookstore, was driving down Redwood Road, a north-south street lined with dilapidated industrial buildings running the length of the city. Locals knew it as something of a rough dividing line between the city's blue-collar west side and the vast salty wastes to the west. It was December 1977, and there was little hope for a white Christmas. 
the weather was overcast and dreary with temperatures stuck in the low 40s. As he drove, Clark kept his eye out for the address given to him by his boss, Sam Weller. Clark spotted the building, turned off the road in front of a nondescript self-storage company and began searching. He was hunting for a numbered door that matched the key he held, the key that had mysteriously arrived with instructions in an anonymous letter sent to Weller. Clark found the door, turned the key and stepped inside. The, uh, the light outside revealed the room's contents, a pile of boxes. The bookseller dutifully loaded them into the vehicle and drove back to Zion's bookstore. They opened the boxes and found 1,800 copies of a, book, a booklet, Gerald and Sandra Tanner's A Distorted View of Mormonism, a response to Mormonism, shadow or reality. The book listed Salt Lake City as its printing location and its author as, quote, a Latter-day Saint historian. A note on the inside cover stressed that the booklet, quote, has not been copyrighted so that it can be reproduced and distributed freely by others if they feel that the contents have value. So Sam Weller, um, he puts the anonymous booklets out to sell. And according to one BYU student who was in Leonard Arrington's class, whose name was Gary Bergera, <laughs> Leonard gives some of the copies to his students. Right, this was towards the end of that, right at the end of that semester. Um, and, and he just, he had these and he passed them out. I don't think he passed them out to everybody in the class, but just to those who he thought would be most interested. Just to the smart ones. So they were available like and, and Arrington was passing, was, was passing them out at that point. Uh, while he was still denying it to everybody else that he knew anything about it. <laughs> okay, so what happened then was... Ron, can you use the mic? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, what happened then was that Ger Gerald had, at this point, vaguely recalled this conversation that he had had on the phone and he remembered the name Quinn so he thought well I better start reading Quinn and see if I can figure this out. So he went and got Quinn's uh, master's thesis from the University of Utah, read through it and figured out that he had enough proof. Uh, one thing was is Quinn used Latin phrases uh, ref referring to fallacies like uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, meaning after this, therefore because of this, which was both in the pamphlet and in the booklet. And so he said, who but Mike Quinn would be doing this? Secondly, he found two footnotes standing right together that showed up in both. And then, uh, then he confronted Quinn. Quinn denies it flatly. And I think we should probably leave it right there for you to talk about Quinn's response to that first call. Okay, so remember how I mentioned that Quinn wrongly guesses that Reed Durham is supplying the Tanners with information. Quinn wrote in his memoir on December for December 30th, 1977, unaware that Reed Durham was collaborating with the Tanners, I was much mentally unprepared for the phone call I received this evening from my journal. After I got home, the phone rang and a high-pitched man's voice. Did Gerald have a high-pitched voice? Well, uh, it was a little higher than other men, but it not, wasn't real high. Maybe, maybe it was really high because he was nervous <laughs> calling Quinn. <laughs> so here's what Quinn's impression was. He says, a high-pitched man's voice asked, are you the author of Gerald and Sandra Tanner's distorted view of Mormonism, a response to Mormonism, shadow or reality? He said, my information is that in a meeting in the LDS historical department, Leonard Arrington asked you to write such a document. Going back to this phone call that actually Reed had uh, made to Gerald back when, before this was going to be anonymous or, or secretly published. Quinn says, I replied that I had no knowledge of such a meeting or conversation. Finally, I asked who it was I was talking to. And he said, as I had suspicion that he was Gerald Tanner. He may have asked me a few more times if I had written the pamphlet, which I flatly denied before our phone conversation end, ended. 
If asked again about this matter, I think I will adopt the policy of not assisting in identifying the author by the process of elimination that will be possible as Tanner and his friends ask various historians if they did or did not write the pamphlet. The last approach is what I should have said at the beginning of our phone call. However, caught completely off guard, I lied repeatedly and reluctantly to Gerald Tanner. I don't know how he thought that like he could write post hoc proctor ergo proctor hoc yeah. in like three different things and not and including the pamphlet and not get figured out. Okay, so um do I take that next? Yes, piece? you go next, Ron. Okay, so what happens is Gerald with this firm denial, he redoubles his effort. He gets hold of uh, Quinn's uh, Yale thesis, and he reads through it, and he, he comes to the conclusion that Quinn is brilliant. He calls it a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he, he doesn't want to attribute the whole pamphlet to, um, to Quinn, because in fact, if you read it, you'll see that areas where Quinn's expertise isn't there, like biblical studies and things, uh, the pamphlet's arguments aren't as strong. In fact, they're quite bad. But where Quinn's expertise was, uh, he was coming up with his usual strange reconstructions of everything, including the first vision and the dates of everything and uh, how it all had to come together to work in a different way than the, the usual way. And so they came up with the idea of referring to the book, to the author as Dr. Clandestine. Uh, still unsure whether it was one, they were sure it was Quinn, but they thought he might have collaborators. And then, so in the meantime, Gerald's looking around for this, this um, paper, because he just, you know, it was just a, one conversation a year previous. And so finally he finds it and there's Quinn's name on it. He was right. And so he calls, uh, I th he calls Quinn again. I think he gets his standard answer that he gave from then on. Even when I ask him, I'll neither confirm nor deny, even ev though everybody by that time knew. <laughs> and um, there's actually a picture of in in Lighthouse. There's a picture of that note, note. where he's written Mike Quinn and Dave Mayfield. Right. And, and there's a few things on the other side. I I think maybe an RD or something which would mean read Durham. But uh, then he called Leonard Arrington. So, so, the, uh, it was like, oh, sorry. So uh, it's actually, I think, I think it's actual, well, I should look at the notes here. Uh, Mike Marquardt calls Arrington first and he calls him like four yeah. times or something. And then, and then Gerald Tanner calls him. And uh, Arrington records in his diary, I received, first of all, he starts out, yesterday seemed to be a low one. I received a call from Gerald Tanner who said that he had just talked with archivist David Mayfield and Mayfield had spilled the beans. Dave admitted to him, he said, uh, Gerald said, that the manuscript was written by Mike Quinn and that it had been produced about a year ago as an assignment from me and that he, David, had seen a transcript. I vehemently, this is Arrington, I vehemently de denied that this was true and had a considerable argument with him, Gerald, uh, completely denying everything. We got into a little argument, into a little bit of a shouting match. I then telephoned Dave, who said that Gerald had telephoned him and asked if he had seen a paper by Mike Quinn, which was a response to the Tanners. Uh, he, uh, Mayfield, said he was caught off guard and did admit that he had seen such a paper. Pretty soon, Gerald Tanner telephoned me, Arrington, again, and apologized for becoming angry with me for my denial. I re-denied the whole business again. <laughs> Tanner said he was going to publish the complete story and no doubt he will publish what he believes to be the true story, but he said that he would publish that I denied it. I telephoned Mike Quinn to tell him this. My own feeling is that the Tanners will use ad hominem argument, attacking Mike personally, me personally, and an attempted Watergate denial. Uh, Arrington then uh, described his own feelings after the phone call with Gerald Tanner. Uh, my job as church historian is an impossible assignment. Uh, he goes on to say, consider the following. Uh, number one, the anti-Mormons, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, seek to use every advantage to get information 
If one is truthful and open, they destroy me by citing you, by declaring I permitted them access, by tripping me up on inconsistencies. They're out to injure the church by injuring me. Two, the highly uh, orthodox, cautious people, such as Elders Ezra Taft Benson, Marky e. Peterson, Boyd K. Packer, are alert for every misstep they want to discredit me. And three, uh, church employee Tom Truitt and also Lawrence Peterson, at an earlier uh, period uh, when Arrington was, uh, just when Arrington became church historian, is a spy for Elders Benson and Peterson. He reads everything I do or say that he can get his hands on, underlines statements which out of context will be objectionable to Elders Benson and Peterson, and sends these on to them. I feel very despondent today, Arrington continues, pessimistic about my future. Feel that I do not have the support of the brethren, also that I do not have the support of the fellow historians I have a right to expect support from. I might add on this that uh, you can tell this was a very tense time for the Mormon historians in the community because there were this Tom Truett was a church employee who really was spying on all the historians to pick up any dirt on them to report to the top leadership of the church that these guys are uh, not being true to the faith. Uh, well, they didn't feel like they were out trying to undermine the church. They just wanted to put out church history. But Truett was uh, just such a uh, devoted uh, defender that he was reporting back. And one of the fallouts from this was another fellow, um, Stan Larson, and, is that right? The Yeah that was at the um, church headquarters as a translator, I believe. And uh, Truett got hold of a copy of a private paper that Stan had done on the use of the uh, King James Sermon on the Mount from Matthew in the Book of Mormon and had given it to a lady in the department. But then Truett got a hold of the paper and ran it right up to the brethren and uh, Stan was given the ultimatum that either he quit or the church would fire him. And if he would quit, he would get a severance package. So not being able to support his family well, if he was fired, he took the buyout. And he went to the University of Utah and became the manuscript, head of manuscript acquisitions or something at the special, collection. special collections at the University of Utah. And uh, Stan was a really nice guy, and it was just a real shame that he got caught in the crossfires of this. But it's just an example of the uh, tension there was in the 70s of, um, of the tug of war on who gets to tell the story and will you get in trouble for it. By the end of January of 1978, the um, Utah Holiday Magazine does a, a, a little story on this and they quote Arrington in the story as saying, I respect the wish of the author of the pamphlet, whoever he or she is to remain anonymous and hope others will also respect that wish. So I think Gary and, and Sandra have kind of explained what the state of things were in the 1970s when it came to church history and church historians. And though I, I, know, I would never justify a lie, but I, as a historian, I always like to seek to understand people, people's motivations for why they do things. And um, when you look at like Leonard's despair at the time, you can see kind of what was driving his motivations. But. Meanwhile, Mike Quinn is kind of enjoying this, I think. Um, he wrote on February 13th, 1978, I was at the historical department of the church today. Glenn Leonard said that he was told by Doug Alder of Utah State University that someone had done a, a computer analysis on the anonymous pamphlet about the Tanners. And the conclusion of the content analysis was that the author was Hugh Nibley. <laughs> First it's Richard Bushman, now it's Hugh Nibley, on a probability scale of 85%. And the remaining possibility was leaning towards Jim Allen. This is truly a very interesting situation. 
Beginning with his pamphlet against Bon Brody's 1945 No Man Knows My History, Nibley was an occasional polemicist against anti-Mormons, as well as a gadfly critic of LDS culture. Since he was a multilingual genius, I rather liked his misidentification, this misidentification of him as the author of my pamphlet. That was how I saw myself in 1976 when he used the pseudonym with the printer. Do we know somebody else who used a pseudonym with a printer? Mark Hoffman? Um, <laughs> um, that's how I saw myself in 1976 when I used the pseudonym with the printer, Hugh Klein, meaning little Hugh. So Ron, do you want to talk about the response? That yeah, the um, just to say, it, oh, yes. Um, it took Gerald, I mean, December 30th was when the pamphlet apparently hit the shelves of Sam Weller's, that was 1977. And it took Gerald about 10 days to feel sure that it was Quinn. And, uh, but so then they began putting together their response. And really the, the content of the pamphlet wasn't the problem. It was all the cloak and dagger, all the, the, the strange circus that, that trying to keep this thing secret. And, uh, and so um, uh, Gerald and Sandra began um, writing a pamphlet entitled um, Answering Dr. Clandestine, a response to the anonymous LDS historian. Uh, and it appeared in less than two uh, months. Um, and then Gerald writes in the book, he says, uh, although Dr. Quinn has almost nothing good to say about us, um, we feel that he is probably one of the best historians in the Mormon church. His dissertation, I've already mentioned this, uh, written for Yale is a masterpiece. And so we go back to what I said earlier about why they called it uh, Dr. Clandestine. However, I believe that this, the basic story was broken in an earlier newsletter. Uh, so February 1978 book is following something. Probably it came out in January. Do you remember, Sandra, when the, when the newsletter came out? No, I had it in the earlier notes we used before, but it doesn't show that here, so I don't have the uh, dates. We had already done a, at least two newsletters talking about the anonymous pamphlet before we did the rebuttal. Okay. So kind of winding up here, we'll just share a last um, a few last few entries from Mike and Leonard. So Mike Quinn wrote on February 17, 1978, um, Elder G. Homer Durham launched into a, launches into a tirade about the anonymous response to the Tanners. Uh, he said he was very upset by its public availability because he had specifically instructed Leonard Arrington not to publish. He now asked if I was its author. Taken aback by this new turn of events, I nonetheless immediately gave my by now standard response to such an inquiry from my journal. Durham moderated the agitation in his voice and quietly but firmly said to me in an earnest manner, now I can appreciate your position of making no comment, but as a priesthood leader, regard this as a personal priesthood interview and tell me if you wrote that anonymous pamphlet. I said that I could only restate my position that I would neither affirm nor deny authorship. Later in the day, as I stood outside Don Schmidt's office, he was the archivist, uh, to get another volume of the McKay Diaries, Durham walked by, winked at me, and gave me what seemed to be a good-natured clenched fist gesture. His manner frankly puzzles me. He is capable of doing a great deal of harm to my research access if I have sufficiently antagonized him. So um, I want to kind of wrap this up so we have time for a Q&A. But um, Gary, do you want to talk about what happened to Leonard quickly on February 24th, 1978? So this is a week, a week after the uh, entry that Barbara just mentioned. Uh, G. Homer Durham had been named the managing director of the historical department. It was, this was like a year, year and a half earlier, year, year and a half earlier that G. Homer Durham had been named. And G. Homer Durham was the uh, general authority. And, and so they had a general authority who had presided over the historical department since its creation back in 7071, uh, and G. Homer Durham was the current managing director. 
and Geomoderm calls Arrington into his office and informs him that the First Presidency has decided to bring the historical department under, uh, under uh, Durham's control with Apostles uh, Hinckley and Packer reporting to the First Presidency. So historical department, uh, Geomer Durham, the Apostles, the First Presidency. Durham at this time also informs Arrington that his title is no longer church historian, but director of the history division. And he tells Arrington not to publicize the change in his title. Quinn writes on March 7th, 1978, shortly thereafter, I told Leonard that I had been informed that after six years of being officially sustained in general conference by appointment of the first presidency as church historian, that he was no longer in that position. Leonard's response was so typical of him that I could have cried. Yes, he said, and now I am finally relieved of having a title that implied that I had the responsibility of giving the official view of LDS history. Now we can go on with our work without that burden. Quinn believed that his pamphlet was the last straw in Durham's backbreaking relationship with Leonard. What a sad outcome of my faith promoting intentions. And then what Leonard wrote. So toward the a uh, few months later in mid-September 1978, uh, Arrington writes in his diary, I regret that given the climate in which we operate and the church bureaucracy, it has been necessary in one or two instances to lie. I have done this with full knowledge and approval of my associates and all of us have felt that this tactic was for the good of the church and the kingdom. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is my desire to be open and honest and it has troubled my conscience to resort to the diplomatic deception. I think something that uh, Ron wrote in Lighthouse on the last, yeah, the last uh, page of this transcript. This comes from Lighthouse. Ron gives an excellent analysis of what it was like to do church history in the 1970s. The 1970s were a unique era in Mormon historiography. The once closed LDS church um, archives had become more accessible, not to everyone, and certainly not to Gerald and Sandra Tanner but certain professional historians and favored graduate students could call at the archives in the east wing of the new church office building on North Temple Street and ask to see documents long inaccessible. It was not a free for all. Some collections remained restricted and historians employed by the church had more access than outsiders, but it seemed to represent a positive shift in how the LDS church approached and handled its history and more people, especially students, were getting involved. But it was still a very fragile and tenuous affair. As this episode uh, certainly demonstrates. We'll now open it up to all of you for any questions. Yes. Um, I have a question and a, a, a comment. <clears throat> One question is that Jim Allen, is that the James Allen of BYU? That Yes, the question is, uh, was the, the Jim Allen that's mentioned in Quinn's memoirs is the same James B. Allen at BYU? And yes, it okay. is. And he was also one of Leonard Arrington's advisors at the church history department as well. Yeah. I, I remember at BYU my freshman year having to take a, I was in the Deseret Towers dormitory. And so we had to go down for this history class go downstairs in the basement of the dormitory and watch an hour of James Allen every twice, two or three times a week or something. Interesting. Yeah, he was a BYU teacher. One, so. one comment I do have is that <clears throat> I, I spent the last 15 years up in Spokane, or 10 years anyway, and uh, while I was up there, uh, I uh, become friends with a couple of pastors and one Lutheran pastor that I was friends with, he had this um, Shadow Reality book. He had the blue one, yeah. blue copy. And uh, he, because he had some people in his congregation that had come from Mormonism. And I remember him asking me, or he showed me the book and he says um, something to the effect that he wanted to know if this was anti Mormon. And I says, No, I'm from, I understand that. Sandra and G Gerald, this is information they got directly from the church histories 
Anyway, something like that. Which, uh, yeah, which Reed Durham was using in his institute class at the <laughs> University of Utah. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Let's give it someone else. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question. No. Okay, good. Is that okay? Yeah. So, so, Barbara, this is, I'm still curious about Quinn because Quinn to me is kind of a, an enigma, and I, and I heard from the John DeLynn. Uh, Mormon stories when we were there and then again tonight. I'm still trying to make sense of Quinn and, and you know, he, um, he decides that Arrington asks him to do this and he says, yes, I'll do it. At that point, it sounds like it wasn't going to be, maybe it wasn't going to be anonymous, but they were also thinking about using it as an in-house kind of thing that they could, you know. Yeah, it's the, part the, of their task the papers. Have, maybe that mm -hmm. or something else. The task papers all had names on them too, so I don't know if they were anticipating that at that point. But then they decide uh, that, that they can't do it for whatever reason, but Quinn can't let it go. Why can't he let that go? Why couldn't he just say, okay, I did this for you, Leonard. Whatever you decide to do with it, that's fine with me. It doesn't seem like he can do that. Yeah, I, I, I'm just guessing based on reading his memoirs over and over again, you kind of get to know a person pretty well. And I'm sure Brian feels the same way working on his diaries. Um, and I, I'd love to hear Brian's take as well. But my take is Quinn had put all of this work into it. And at the time, he's, you know, a young guy. He's in his early 30s, just out of his PhD program at Yale. Um, and he considers this his magnum opus at the time, is how he describes it. He wanted people to read it. And it kind of comes out in his memoir when he talks about how tickled he is, that everybody's reading it and trying to guess who it is. So my, my take is he thought, I put so much work into this. It's really brilliant. It's really good. I want everyone to read it. So we decided just to go forward and, 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 and play this little game and, and publish it anonymously. Brian, do you have, what's your take? Wait a minute, Brian, before you do, let me just oh. ask a follow-up. Okay. Because the, the other thing, one of the other questions that I have about Mike's involvement with this is his wanting it to be anonymous. And the, the idea that uh, he's worried that if it ever came out that he was gay, that that would somehow be used against the credibility. And yet at the same time, he's publishing widely on controversial topics under his own name. Was he in 1976, 77? Well, yeah, he, he already was. was. He was already then. doing a lot, of, a lot yeah. of publishing. Yeah, I think, I mean, it started with Leonard telling him this has to be anonymous. And then Mike says, oh, okay, well, I have my own reasons. But so, Brian, what, what's your take on all this? Um, I think he blames Leonard for the anonymous part of it a little too much. I think he wanted, in fact, he outlines at one point his three motivations for that. He says, first, he, uh, he said that it'll better be able to be judged on its merits if it's anonymous, which is kind of true, but also not really, because as Gary points out, he's publishing everything else under his name, mm -hmm. and scholarship is done under a name, generally. So that's, right. that's an odd point. The second motivation he gives is that he doesn't want to be what he calls a religious polemicist. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. wants to do it. He considers it his magnum opus. He says it's necessary, ultimately, but he is also squeamish about being associated with it. And the third reason he gives was that he could better protect Leonard and the historical department by doing it anonymously. So the question of whether that was his after the fact rationalization for it, I think he wanted it to be anonymous. So I think he, he blames Leonard too much for it being anonymous. Yeah, so you think he kind of lays this at the feet of Leonard of telling him to be anonymous, but he has his own reasons for just yeah. wanting it to be anonymous anyway. Yeah. Do you think he, he did, like you said, he doesn't want to be seen as a polemicist, so do you think he doesn't want to be seen as an apologist? Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think at the end of it, he wasn't totally comfortable with the pamphlet. Uh, as in Gary knows, <clears throat> Quinn loved to tinker with things until the last second, and sometimes after the last second. Yes. <laughs> and, and that was, Gerald noticed um, that between the first draft and the published version, he had added several things to the footnotes. So he was constantly working with it. So he was never totally satisfied with his work because he always wanted to find something else to put in. Mm, yeah, there were a lot of things going on. It was very complex. He wrote 40 pages about this pamphlet in his journal. Yeah. It was very important. Okay. To 
so so Brian Buchanan says uh, he just he was constantly tinkering with it. Uh, he kept adding things to it. He wrote forty pages about this, and he thinks that it's it's actually uh, Mike Quinn that wanted to do this anonymous more than, and then poor Leonard really takes the heat for it. Oh, uh, I was going to say one other yeah. thing about that too. Hey, Brian, come on up. I'm going to ask you to come okay. use the mic so we can sure. um, just because we're recording this and um, then. The, the culture and this, you mentioned the idea that, um, come to just, you want to use the Do stand, yeah, because yeah. so, so Ron can come back. Um, this idea of, they didn't like lying, but they would do it because it was for the kingdom, kind of. You see that rationale. It's very interesting, when he would talk about um, post-manifesto polygamy, he would frequently refer to this editorial that Joseph F. Smith had written in the Deseret News talking about telling the public one thing while doing another thing privately. Mm -hmm. And what he used was very interesting. He used the New Testament story of uh, Jesus telling the apostles not to tell anyone that they had seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, what if somebody had come to them and asked, did you see Jesus? They would have had to say no because they were under a covenant to not tell them. That's a fascinating story. And once you read this part of his life, you can see why he was drawn to that rationale. Fascinating. And also, um, I think it's important to note that Mike Quinn uh, chose to live as a closeted gay man for much of his life and chose to be married to a woman and was trying to, thought he could and was taught he could um, repress that successfully. And um, so he was hiding that. And then his father, who was Mexican, uh, tried to pass as white his whole life, and Quinn had a problem with his father repressing and trying to hide things. But yet, uh, that's that; those are part of Quinn's identities that he was always hiding. So this is kind of part of a, a pattern, a life pattern for him. Okay, question on the front row. Yes. Yeah, so most of the interactions with D. Michael Quinn sounded like they were over the phone, but I'm wondering, Sandra, if you ever had face-to-face -face interactions with him, and if you did, what were those like? Okay, so the question was um, whether Sandra ever had face-to-face -face interactions with Quinn, and if so, if so, what were those like? No, I never directly talked with Quinn, and as far as I know, Gerald didn't either after the, these incidences on this later on. No, we never talked to him. Um, not that I wouldn't talk to him, it just didn't occur. Now at Sunstone, uh, there were a couple of different talks of his where I got up and asked questions of him that he responded to and everything was fine as far as that goes, uh, but never directly discussing anything with him. Sandra does have lots of interactions with Mark Hoffman though, yeah. but if you want to hear about that, you need to read Late Lighthouse. <laughs> okay, there was a question back here. Yes. Uh, what year Rick. was Mike Quinn uh, voted Professor of the Year, and when did he leave UA? So the question was, what year was Mike Quinn voted Professor of the Year or Teacher of the Year by yeah. students, and what year did he leave uh, uh, BYU? He left BYU in 1988, and I believe he was voted, voted Professor of the Year at 1986. That's or, for the journal then. I was thinking yeah. 82, 83. Okay, so sometime, yeah, sometime in the early 80s, and then a few years later, he chooses to leave BYU. And, and, and it was made very uncomfortable for him at BYU, and he kind of saw the writing on the wall, but he makes clear in his memoir, he was not fired from BYU. That was, uh, he kind of felt like he had no <laughs> choice, but he did, he did leave. He did resign. Yes, right here. Okay. In addition, you, you said that there was a rebuttal made to the pamphlet. Uh, where is that? Can we get that? And also, did did Quinn later in life ever express that maybe he was wrong or that the pamphlet didn't? Did he ever mention whether he felt it was effective in the world? Yes. So I'll answer the second question, and then I'll give it over to, to Sandra for the first. Um, he expresses remorse in his memoir. He says he is very sorry about it, but I asked Sandra about this. He never apologized to Sandra or Gerald. And then in terms of the rebuttal that the Tanners wrote, I'll let Ans uh, Sandra answer that one. Uh, yes, we uh, put out a pamphlet answering Dr. Clandestine and it's out of print. 
and uh, you can download a PDF of it from our website at utlm.org. And, and Shadow, Mormonism, Shadow Reality, all our, not all of our books, but uh, many of our things are on PDF form, even though we no longer are printing them. Um, I might say on, as far as some of Mike's criticisms, and when talking about him always tinkering with his stuff, Gerald would have liked to have done the same had he had a word processor. But when you look at our material, we were just doing this on typewriters. And Gerald was not about to retype the whole book to change a page or two. And another criticism I think Mike has in his pamphlet is that uh, Gerald repeats himself over and over again. And he said it was like, I think he talks about Chinese water torture or something, but uh, of Gerald driving it nuts with saying the same thing over and over. Again, this was a problem of our technology of the day. And it also was a problem of Gerald writing different articles that eventually were incorporated into the book. And so you would get repeats because uh, the, some of the different chapters were written as separate articles. And so then in another chapter, he would repeat some of that to bring you up to speed on what he's talking about. Uh, our work always suffered from the need of being edited, but you had to retype it all to do editing. And so even when I would read his draft and I would think, oh, Gerald, uh, you know, yeah, that's <laughs> probably not the best wording. Uh, he's already got it all typed. So unless I'm going to retype the whole thing, uh, that's the way it's going to go out. So anyway, with all those all capped words. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, again, we're using a typewriter, uh, but this was a model that he had seen in the little splinter group we went into in uh, 59 and 60, 61, 62, um, in Independence, Missouri, the little Church of Christ that followed just the Bible and Book of Mormon. And Pauline Hancock wrote articles in the Independence newspaper once a week. And if you look at her articles, she uses the, all that capitalizing, underlining everything in all her little articles. So Gerald studied under Pauline and he's following right along doing the same editorial kind of typing out of his documents um, that he had seen her use. Uh, we didn't have college educations. Uh, we should have taken classes at college, but we had not completed anything. And uh, Gerald took remedial English at the University of Utah <laughs> and I don't even know why they let him in, but uh, <laughs> he wouldn't be admitted today. I mean, it, they just must have really been lacking for students, but uh, <laughs> Gerald had done everything he could to avoid schooling. But uh, so, yes, Gerald would be the first to admit, yes, there are a lot of uh, things lacking in the production of the books, but he felt that he had done the research and that the research stood up even if the typing didn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe Gerald wasn't formally educated, but I think he was a great mind. I mean, he was the one that figured out that the salamander, he was the first to say that the salamander was a forgery, even though Sander was like, no, we need this to be true. Um, and he, uh, he figured out that this was Mike Quinn. He figured out, uh, what was the other letter? The Oliver Cowdery tract was yeah. a forgery and an and, and anti-Mormon tract. So Gerald actually sometimes was defending Mormonism. I don't think people know that yeah. about Gerald and Sandra, but I think he was a great mind, even if he wasn't a trained right. academic. So question right here, yes. So first of all, thank you. This is incredible. I'm pretty new to this whole world, so forgive me if my question sounds really- No, we're so glad you're so here. Good. Thanks for coming. And secondly, the church itself, do you feel like they have finally addressed it with their gospel topic that they went up as far as you saw? 
Okay, so repeating the question to Sandra, do you feel that Mormonism, shadow of reality has ever been sufficiently answered, uh, including with the church's gospel topics, essays that are now available on the church's website that do talk about these things? Gospel topics is the closest to a sizable treatment of the different problem areas <coughs> we raised. I don't think they answer the questions. Uh, they sugarcoat, to me, very serious historical issues. I think most people realize there are the different accounts of the first vision do raise serious historical problems with dating the event. And what is uh, claimed to have happened the motivation for going out in the woods to pray, what year it is, was there a revival, what was he told, what was the aftermath, they're different in the different accounts. And I don't think that Gospel Topics adequately addresses the problem we raised. And we were talking about these issues in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think they still have adequately dealt with the problem. The same could be said of the Book of Abraham. Uh, our problems that we raised on the Book of Mormon when we finally gave that up. Uh, all of these different problem areas in the church that we discussed in the 60s. You look at this uh, blue edition of our 64 Shadow Reality and all those topics are in there that you got in the Gospel Topics and I don't feel that Gospel Topics has sufficiently answered the problem and that's why I think you have all the books that you have today on Mormon history because a lot of historians also could see that there was a big problem in telling the story with the old church line and they're still struggling to figure out how to deal with it without it uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, I think we're out of time. Please join me in thanking Sandra Tanner and authors Ron Huggins and Gary Burgett. So if you're interested, um, Ron, Sandra, and Gary, uh, if you're interested in purchasing a book for them to sign, they'd be very happy to do so. And as I mentioned, if you want it now after hearing this presentation, get a hold of this pamphlet. We have those over there as well. We also have, uh, Debra Anderson has curated books that we think if you're interested in this topic tonight, you'll be interested in any of the books over on the tables. Also a reminder, Stephen Carter. Stephen, are you still here? Hi, Stephen. Stephen will be over here signing his new Virginia Sorensen biography, and we will be having an event in May to uh, talk about that as well. So thank you again for coming tonight.